Good evening, everyone. We're thrilled to welcome you to this evening's Third Thursday program. Please note that all participants' microphones are muted by default. We are recording this evening's program, so if you prefer not to appear in the recording, be sure to turn off your video. However, if you'd like to turn on your video at any time, you're welcome to do so. And wave hello to everyone who's tuning in or catching the recording. This month's Artful Trivia is a partnership program of the Asheville Art Museum, High Wire Brewing, and Food Experience. My name is Christy McMillan, and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the museum. I'll be your quiz master tonight. I don't know about you, but one of the things I've missed most during the past few months is getting to spend a casual and fun night out with friends at a favorite local brewery playing trivia. Things are slowly opening back up, but because we like to err on the side of caution here at the museum and make sure our visitors are as safe as possible, we're so happy that you could join us virtually tonight. The museum is open with lots of safety protocols in place, so we do have some attendees who are tuning in from our rooftop perspective cafe. Hello in the cafe. If you haven't yet been up there since we reopened, be sure to stop by on your next visit. High Wire's tap room is also open, and they have a fantastic selection of beers, such as the one that we'll be tasting tonight, the Low Pitch Hazy IPA. Now I'd like to briefly go over the flow of tonight's program. There will be four thematic rounds of trivia focused on art related to tonight's theme of food, drink, and entertainment. Each round has five art questions, plus one general knowledge bonus question. Here's how to play. First, you can make it a friendly competition with those at home with you or test your art knowledge on your own. We'll review answers from the previous round before each new round, so you'll be able to track your own scores. We sent out a link to the score sheet with your confirmation, or you can use scratch paper. The second option is to play for prizes against other participants playing from home or in Perspective Cafe tonight. If you want to play competitively, please be sure to answer through the polls we'll post on the screen, like the one you see now. If you're playing in the cafe, turn in your score sheets to our staff member at the end of each round. Once a poll is closed, we can't reopen it, so make sure you get your answers in on time. We recommend that those playing competitively also keep track of your answers at home with our score sheet or scratch paper because, while well, the internet glitches do happen, as we all know. Scores will be tallied after the program. We'll post the names of the first, second, and third place winners on our website and social media tomorrow. We'll email winners as well to make arrangements to collect your prize. First prize will be a $25 gift card to Perspective Cafe. This does not include alcohol or gratuity, unfortunately, but I think that you'll find there are lots of yummy food options for you to choose from. Second prize is an Asheville Art Museum beanie to keep you warm on the upcoming cold fall and winter days. Third prize is an Asheville Art Museum mug so that you can enjoy your favorite hot beverage every morning. Between rounds, we'll hear from Chris McLean from High Wire Brewing. He'll tell us a little bit about this great local brewery and walk us through a tasting of their low pitch hazy IPA. We'll also visit with our friends Emily and Josh Kopis as they share some tips on creating the perfect tablescape with a go gorgeous flower bouquet from Carolina Flowers using Josh's pottery. Finally, our friends in Perspective Cafe will broadcast live as they serve up some savory and sweet fall treats. Before we get started, are there any questions? You can enter questions at any time in the chat box and either I or one of my colleagues working hard behind the scenes will respond. Okay, let's get started with round one of Artful Trivia. Round one is entitled Down the Hatch. This round is all about the drinks, the ones we and artists love, or artworks and craft objects about or for drinking. Okay, question one. 
While best known for hard drinking and endless partying with her husband during the Roaring Twenties, this multi-hyphenate was also a skilled painter of flowers, cityscapes, biblical scenes, and delicate paper dolls. Was it A, Louise Brooks, B, Gloria Swanson, C, Josephine Baker, or D, Zelda Fitzgerald? Number one. While best known for hard drinking and endless partying with her husband during the Roaring Twenties, this multi-hyphenate was also a skilled painter of flowers, cityscapes, biblical scenes, and delicate paper dolls. Was it A, Louise Brooks, B, Gloria Swanson, C, Josephine Baker, or D, Zelda Fitzgerald? Okay, question two. Painter Georgia O'Keeffe, who lived to the ripe age of 98, owed her longevity to imbibing this drink habitually. Was it A, bourbon, B, vegetable juice, C, water, or D, wine? Painter Georgia O'Keeffe, who lived to the ripe age of 98, owed her longevity to imbibing this drink habitually. Was it A, bourbon, B, vegetable juice, C, water, or D, wine? Okay, number three. The winery owned by this filmmaker regularly commissions artists to create quirky labels for its reserve label wines. Is it A, Drew Barrymore, B, Francis Ford Coppola, C, M. Night Shyamalan, or D, Wes Anderson? The winery owned by this filmmaker regularly commissions artists to create quirky labels for its reserve label wines. Is it A, Drew Barrymore, B, Francis Ford Coppola, C, M. Night Shyamalan, or D, Wes Anderson? Number four. In his iconic painting, Nighthawks, picturing three disconnected denizens in a bar at night, what are the lonely drinkers sipping? Is it A, absinthe, B, beer, C, cocktails, or D, coffee? In his iconic painting, Nighthawks, picturing three disconnected denizens in a bar at night, what are the lonely drinkers sipping? Is it A, absinthe, B, beer, C, cocktails, or D, coffee? Number five, Western North Carolina artist, Michael Sherrill, known for his transcendent organic sculptures in ceramic, metal, and glass, started his career making which kinds of beverage containers? Was it A, beer signs, B, teacups, C, water jugs, or D, wine glasses? Western North Carolina artist, Michael Sherrill, known for his transcendent organic sculptures in ceramic, metal, and glass, started his career making which kinds of beverage containers? A, beer steins, B, teacups, C, water jugs, or D, wine glasses? Okay, now for our round one bonus question provided by High Wire Brewing. Which off flavor in beer is often described using terms like buttery, slick, movie popcorn, and butterscotch? And please help me, Chris, if I pronounce these wrong. A, butyric acid, B, diacetyl, C, dimethyl sulfide, or D, 
isoamyl acetate. Which off flavor in beer is often described using terms like buttery, slick, movie popcorn, and butterscotch? A, butyric acid, B, diacetyl, C, dimethyl sulfide, or D, isoamyl acetate? All right, everyone, that's the end of round one. Great job. We're ready for our first break. Let's welcome Chris McLean of Highwire Brewing. Highwire has been a wonderful supporter of the museum over the years, and we love Highwire beer, not only for its taste, but also for its fun can designs. Please feel free to put any questions you have for Chris in the chat box. Chris, thanks so much for being here tonight. Please tell us a bit about Highwire and this new beer. Thanks, Christy. Uh, first, I think you did an excellent job with the pronunciations. Uh, <laughs> I was really nervous about it. <laughs> you know, I put up some hard, uh, some hard things there to say, so you, you knocked it out of the park. Um, so for kind of what we're going through here tonight, I thought I would share a brand new beer we have that is just coming out in the market. Uh, a lot of folks may already know Low Pitch, but they don't know its new look. Uh, we have turned it into a hazy IPA. So this is now available at our tap room and it'll soon be out and about in the world in your you know, local Ingalls, Harris Teeter, um, Food Lion, where, wherever you may shop. Um, but as far as Highwire goes, you know, we've been around for, gosh, just over seven years now, and it's, uh, it's been a fun ride. Um, you know, we, we don't take ourselves too seriously, uh, you know, hence the whole circus theme and some of the fun artwork. Um, you know, we kind of have some new designs here, so unfortunately our uh, dog is no longer on the low pitch, uh, but we've got these bright, vivid colors on this new package, and... Uh, I don't know if you guys can all see me, but uh, kind of a new uh, hazy format of the low pitch. Um, some fun things that we were doing here, you know, uh, things like this. Uh, if you are enjoy, if you enjoy IPAs, you obviously know that hazy IPAs are the big thing right now. Uh, so we wanted to kind of tweak a, a, a an already great beer and and make it. Uh, a little bit better for the folks that enjoy this style. Uh, one of the fun things about this style is if you're not a big IPA person, uh, as far as the bitterness goes, hazy IPAs tend to be a little less bitter, and this one's just the same. Uh, we use a lot of what we call late edition hops. So those add flavor and they add aroma, but they don't really add a lot of bitterness. So you get, you know, all these fun, uh, bright, citrus, uh, really kind of juicy uh, flavor characteristics out of it without all the bitterness of something like uh, our high pitch IPA, which is more of that classic style IPA. Um, some other uh, fun things that we have going on here at the brewery, you know, we are currently open to the public. Uh, unfortunately, you know, as everyone else is going, we are uh, reduced to half capacity, uh, but we've done some really fun things down at our big top location. We've taken up some of our parking spots out front and uh, created a little, little patio that's uh, covered. So if it's, uh, the weather's a little questionable, we have uh, some tents up and stuff like that. And we actually, have some igloos coming up soon, which I'm very excited to see for the winter season that uh, should be heated. And trust me, I have no idea what a heated igloo uh, looks like or necessarily means in terms of coming out and hanging and drinking some beer. Uh, but we're going to continue to take precautions and stay open and do everything we can to, to be able to allow people to have a, a fun time. Um, so 
that's something something we have going on. Uh, as far as you know, we were talking about Christy and I were talking about some of the artwork we have going on. Uh, I don't know if you guys all see what we do, uh, especially with some of the the fun small batch stuff. I actually have some cans. I'm sitting at my desk at work, you know. Uh, some some bottles here with some of these cool labels. I don't know if you all can see these, but uh, we actually have uh, a guy in house. His name is Javi. He used to be a bartender with us and has this really great creative edge. And one of the, the, the wonderful things I love about what we do is we like to recognize people that work with us and give them sort of their outlet for what they do well. So this guy, Javi, makes fantastic labels and he's super creative. So he's been, uh, for the past several years, working all of our beer labels and logos and stuff like that. So all the, the cool, fun artwork that you've seen coming out from us has actually been from a, a, a guy that we have internally that started off as a bartender. Um, I mean, what a, what a fun story to be able to pull yourself up from that, that level. And then, uh, you know, when he, he's actually won a lot of uh, really cool awards for the artwork that we've done or that he's done for us. So, uh, some really fun things there. I did have a question come in, Chris. Yeah. Um, what makes the, the low pitch hazy IPA hazy? It's a great question. Um, for a lot of hazy IPAs, uh, they do use lactose. Uh, so it's a milk sugar. Uh, but actually, and we do use that for our hazy, juicy, hoppy, fresh, but for the low pitch hazy, we're actually using, uh, oats. So they kind of help keep some of these, uh, proteins and hop particulates in suspension, uh, versus filtering them out. So it kind of adds a little bit of haze to the, uh, the beer, um, also, when you do a lot of late addition hopping, which is basically the beer is already fermented, and then you add uh, extra hops to it, you get a lot of uh, a lot of uh, hop matter in there, uh, which kind of just lingers around, which uh, once again leads to aroma and flavor. Um, so heavy-handed hops in the back end will often uh, kind of stay in the beer versus when you're doing it uh, in the, the what we call the hot side. So when you add it in the boil, that's where you, you, you get all your bitterness, and then we kind of clean that up uh, during fermentation. Uh, but when we add late addition hops, it doesn't clean up so much. So I have to ask, without giving away the answer to that bonus question, um, how would you then describe the off flavors in the low pitch hazy, hazy IPA? Uh, we don't have off flavors. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and if we do, uh, please let us know. We, <laughs> one of the big things we, we strive to do in our head brewer is, you know, a, a super nerd about it. And he's, he's very... Um, dedicated to what he creates um you know one of the things we want to do is is have consistent beer that doesn't have off flavors um you know i think one of the the big things that we face and i think a lot of breweries face is actually oxidation which was not on there which um is just the introduction of oxygen into beer which you know over time and with uh, a lot of presents will kind of give a wet cardboard taste, but we, with, with the canning line we have installed now and with uh, the, the great folks in our packaging team, they do a really good job to, to minimize that and, and keep, um, you know, any off flavors to uh, a non-existent minimum. So all flavors, then, that's just a, not a term that I had heard before. It's kind of like when something goes off is what you're saying. So if your beer tastes buttery or like movie popcorn or butterscotch, that's bad. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> it's not like wine when people are like describing the, yeah. you know, these are the, I have chocolate and blueberry and 
you know, we, we, we describe things like that as well. Uh, but when you uh, are making, you know, whether it's wine, beer, uh, liquor, tea, coffee, any, any sort of uh, beverage or food there, uh, there are things that you need to take into consideration and try to make sure that they don't uh, take over your beer or uh, whatever your product is. Uh, so yeah, things like, uh, you know, butteriness, especially in a uh, nice crisp lager might be really bad. Um, it might also be delicious if that's uh, something you enjoy. <laughs> if that's your thing. <laughs> but it's not a classic uh, example of that style, so. Awesome. Well, thank you, Chris. I learned something new today. I always say that it's a good day when I learn something new. So you taught me something today and I'm very grateful. <laughs> if anyone has any further questions for Chris, we'll have time for more Q&A in a little while. Thanks again, Chris. Um, now let's review uh, answers from round one before we start uh, round two. Uh, before we do that, if I can get my screens together. I would like to just um, put up High Wire's um, website there so that you can see their website. So if you'd like to go uh, learn more about the brewery and uh, have a really pleasant online shopping experience, I had fun browsing uh, their shop online. Uh, there is the uh, website for you. All right. All right, so now uh, let's review answers from round one before we start round two. Are you guys excited? All right, round one, question one. Zelda Sarah Fitzgerald was also a skilled painter of flowers, cityscapes, biblical scenes, and delicate paper dolls. We have one of her rare, gorgeous flower paintings in the museum's collection. Question two. The answer was vegetable juice. O'Keefe was known for making vegetable juice and fruit smoothies for visitors to her home. She grew many of her own raw ingredients. Question three. I think that uh, I didn't stump anyone on this one. Although there are some quirky filmmakers on this list, it's Francis Ford Coppola who commissions art uh, artist to create labels for his wineries, reserve label wines. In Nighthawks, even though they're in a bar, they've each got a coffee cup in front of them. Question five, although Michael Sherrill's teapot, teapots are to die for, the answer is beer steins. And finally, we all just learned about those off uh, tastes that are in beer, and those are caused by, caused by diacetyl. Um, how did you do? Are you ready for round two? All right, let's get started. Round two is Party On, featuring artworks about artists' nightlife, flowers, real and imagined gatherings, and the things on our tables. Let's see what you know. All right, let me get my screen set up here. Great, all right, question one. Although only open for a total of five years in the 1970s and 1980s, this storied disco was a hot spot for New York's glitterati, whom Andy Warhol chronicled extensively with his Polaroid camera. Was it A, CBGB? B, Copacabana, C, Studio 54, or D, The Cotton Club. Although only open for a total of five years in the 1970s and 1980s, this storied disco was a hot spot for New York's glitterati, whom Andy Warhol chronicled extensively with his Polaroid camera. Was it A, CBGB, B, Copacabana, C, Studio 54, or D, The Cotton Club? Question two. You'd need a pretty large table to fit, to fit this sculptor's puppy, a 43 foot tall West Highland Terrier covered in a colorful carpet of over 60,000 flowering plants. Is it A, Jeff Koons, B, Jenny Holzer, 
C, Matthew Barney, or D, Robert Indiana. You'd need a pretty large table to fit this sculptor's puppy, a 43 foot tall West Highland Terrier covered in a colorful carpet of over 60,000 flowering plants. Is it A, Jeff Koons, B, Jenny Holzer, C, Matthew Barney, or D, Robert Indiana? Question three. Judy Chicago's iconic feminist installation, The Dinner Party, commemorates important women from history. What shape is the banquet table on which its 39 place settings are installed? Is it A, oval, B, rectangle, C, square, or D, triangle? Judy Chicago's iconic feminist installation, The Dinner Party, commemorates important women from history. What shape is the banquet table on which its 39 place settings are installed? Is it A, oval, B, rectangle, C, square, or D, triangle? Question four. In 1943, Norman Rockwell illustrated President Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms to build support for the war effort. In his Freedom from Want, he paints a family celebrating which holiday? Is it A, Halloween, B, Independence Day, C, Memorial Day, or D, Thanksgiving? In 1943, Norman Rockwell illustrated President Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms to build support for the war effort. In his Freedom from Want, he paints a family celebrating which holiday? Is it A, Halloween, B, Independence Day, C, Memorial Day, or D, Thanksgiving? Question five. Walter B. Stevens ceramic tableware shows scenes of Appalachian frontier life, reminiscent of this English manufacturer's famous Jasper ware with applied decorations. Is it A, Chelsea, B, Royal Dalton, C, Staffordshire, or D, Wedgwood? Walter B. Stevens ceramic tableware shows scenes of Appalachian frontier life, reminiscent of this English manufacturer's famous Jasper ware with applied decorations. Is it A, Chelsea, B, Royal Dalton, C, Staffordshire, or D, Wedgwood? Okay. Now for our round two bonus question provided by Highwire Brewing, and Chris says that this is the easier of the two questions. Which of these beers is a lager? Is it A, Baltic Porter, B, IPA, C, Kolsch, or D, Wit Beer? Which of these beers is a lager? A, Baltic Porter, B, IPA, C, Kolsch, or D, Whitbeer? All right, everyone, that's the end of round two. How are you holding up? Okay, now for our second break. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, artists Josh and Emily Kopis. Many of you probably already know this creative couple. Josh is a potter whose work was featured in our exhibition Appalachia Now and is represented by our gallery neighbors, Blue Spiral One. Emily is the force behind Carolina Flowers, a local farm and florist. You may have seen her at some of the farmer's markets we have around Asheville. Josh and Emily, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Can you hear us okay? Yeah. Okay. 
Great. Great. Well, we wanted to set it up so we could show you our flower shop, which is newly reopened uh, post our little COVID closure. Um, we're out here in Marshall, um, which is the center of our operations, but uh, our business is delivered to Asheville every day except for Sunday. Um, so um, those are Carolina Flowers, which is our flower farm and, and uh, flower uh, design business. And then we also have Zadie's Market, <laughs> um, which is our new business that we have uh, that offers grocery delivery at the moment. Um, but we're working very hard on the first brick and mortar location in the old Marshall Jail, uh, which is Josh's current uh, project that's more than just a renovation project, it's also part of his uh, practice as an artist. So, um, you know, uh, here is a, a piece of, of uh, wood pirate ceramics that is uh, really typical of what Josh makes, um, but he has translated this aesthetic to an entire building. Um, uh, like a Go inside, kind of. Yeah, so we, in addition to doing ceramics and the flower farm, we bought the oldest operational jail in the state of North Carolina at a property auction in 2016 from the county of Madison. And uh, we've been renovating that building. It's going to be a hotel, a little mini hotel upstairs. And then a Zadie's or Market Deli grocery is going to go downstairs, and there'll be a little bar in it as well. And the whole thing really is a big art installation project. In addition to doing ceramics, you know, I do a lot of metal work. And, um, the bricks that we made for the threshold piece that was at the Appalachian Now. Uh, museum grand opening exhibit. All of those bricks actually will live permanently at the jail. Uh, there's a number of areas where the installations are happening. So the exterior wall of the addition will get faced with those bricks. And then there's a number of areas on the inside where we made very specific bricks that tell the history of the building and the history of the people who were associated with it. So the Appalachian Now installation had close to a thousand bricks in it. And um, the total number of bricks that we made during this project is was over 5,000. So there's a bunch that no one's seen before that will be permanently installed at the jail. Um, so it's, it's a cool, exciting thing. And one of the things that I think is interesting, uh, for me personally, I've always considered, you know, everything to be the art. Um, and right now, even more so than my ceramic work, this is my main creative focus. Um, and I think art artists are really well suited to doing historical renovation because the whole thing is just a big problem solving experience and, and really that's a lot of like what art is about for me is, is you know just creating solutions um, and so people often ask me like what are you doing right now and I say oh I'm renovating this old jail and they're like yeah but what are you doing like artistically and that's my answer. It's, it, so it really is my art practice, and it's exciting that it's going to be, a, you know, it's our family business, and it's going to be a big part of our legacy, and, um, you know, it's really important to the development, uh, sustainable, you know, regeneration of the town of Marshall, so... So for a long time, we, we weren't sure whether we would put a business in uh, the building that we had spent so many years working on. Um, but 
when COVID started, um, we had our delivery business for the flower farm up and running doing daily flower delivery to Asheville. And so it made sense for us to um, help out other farmers who had lost their restaurant clients because of all of the closures. And so um, that's when we decided to start delivering groceries as well. Um, and that idea um, spiraled into a, a, a full line of grocery products that are gonna live in the jail. Um, but the nice thing is that you don't have to wait to support the project until the building is actually open, although you won't have to wait long. Um, we deliver groceries and flowers to Asheville every day. Um, and you can order both at babiesmarket.com um, or at carolinaflowers.com. Um, and you can also pick up groceries, even though the shopping uh, in the jail isn't open yet. You can pick them up here at the flower shop or shop for flowers. Um, uh, we accommodate pickups uh, Monday through Saturday, and then the shop is open, open. Um, on Wednesday through Saturday from 11 to 6 here on Main Street in Marshall. Um, so we're really excited to be working on projects that are so accessible for people um, and, and to be able to experience sort of what we do with art and with agriculture on a more regular basis. You guys sound super duper busy. <laughs> it's like every time I turn around, you guys have something else going on. Yeah, I just left the jail. That's why I look like kind of a homeless person because pretty much I work there like 12 hours a day, six and a half days a week. We're, we're about two months out from completion. And this wow. Is where um, like a lot is happening. So, and if y'all are interested, uh, the jail, Old Marshall Jail has a website, oldmarshalljail.com. And there's a really good Instagram account that, Basically, the whole entire renovation process from the first thing that we did in there, which was pull up the linoleum floor in the sheriff's office, the whole thing's 100% documented, so you can see all the steps. So let me just ask you guys a quick question, and then yeah. I would love to see what is on the table behind you. Yeah. But Emily, <laughs> you had mentioned that you can get to uh, the grocery business from Carolina Flowers, correct? Yeah, so if you click on, um, there's a drop down menu for shopping. Um, you can click on groceries okay. from carolinaflowers.com and it'll take you over to the Zadie's website. You can also just go straight to um, Zadie's Flowers and the groceries live there. Um, uh, and that's zadiesmarket.com. Um, okay, zadiesmarket.com. And Josh, can you get to the Old Marshall Jail website through joshcopus.com? I'm sure that you can. I hope so. I the reason I have I have a reason why I asked. I've got those two websites on a slide to share with folks, yeah. so that way yeah. people can get to where they need to go. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, what do you guys have going on on that table? So we yeah. knew you guys were a total power couple, and that you'd give us beautiful ceramics and beautiful flowers for our tablescape. Yeah. So this is our um, shop display table, but. We've used some of the same principles um, that you would use when setting a table for entertaining. We've got lots of levels going on here. We've got color sort of traced evenly throughout the table. And then we've also got this um, Josh Cook's pottery uh, vessel here um, and some flowers. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the things that Josh and I talk about a lot is um, what types of arrangements belong in these um, uh, sort of Korean inspired, uh, okay. <laughs> um, these very, uh, um, Angular. Angular, Josh, would you mind bringing that just a little bit closer to the camera so that we can see it? Sorry. Beautiful. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so, so, uh, you know, I tend to want to stuff everything full of flowers to the brim, but we, we've reached an agreement that less is more when it comes to these super structural vessels. Um, so, uh, we don't want to get too carried away here, but we have uh, just some, some things to do a little arrangement. Uh, one of the best things to remember when you're working with um, uh, fresh floral product is just to 
strip any of the leaves and things like this that are going to be below the mouth of the vase. Um, so you really don't want this stuff, uh, these side shoots down in your vase, and you definitely don't want them down in the water. Um, that's what creates all sorts of bacteria, um, and it'll make your flowers fade much, much faster. Um, so we kind of want to pop that stuff off. Um, and then, you know, you're always kind of arranging at an angle here. Um, I don't do a lot of straight up and down, Josh. Josh has his own uh, style of floral design, um, but uh, I'm actually going to go with something a little more bold. Um, these pots are really earthy, so you can either play with that or you can dial up the contrast. Um, I'm going to choose a few blooms that are um, that are more uh, melding with the, the colors of the pot. Um, kind of a sunset -y thing. Um, and it doesn't take a whole lot. Let's see, Josh, say when. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a funny thing. Uh, my idea of floral design is, is like one or two things. And, and I think a lot of that is because I'm very interested in the vessel where um, a lot of what Emily does, the vessel is kind of like less important. The focus is on the flower. So I probably would have stopped uh, a while that's ago. One. But that's, a, that's sort of a nice, a nice, um, nice uh, balance here. And what, um, what kind of flowers did you choose, Emily? Oh, These are yeah. all, um, dahlias from our farm um, and then some eucalyptus uh, from our farm as well. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good start and it's and, and it's a really um, one thing I love about Josh's vessels is that you don't you really don't have to do a whole lot um, for your arrangement to look artistic the, the vessel does all the work um, so uh, just having nice high quality local flowers um, really goes a long way I love the way that the uh, colors that you chose really um, contrast, but also complement with the vessel. Yeah, definitely some of these orangey undertones. Um, this is all wood fired ceramics um, made from North Carolina clay. Um, all right. Great. Well, what Great. would you, what would you. Let's see, we can't hear you for some reason. Can't hear. No, oh well. <laughs> Christy, your sound has cut out. Nope. Is it working now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me now, Emily? Yes, much better. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so uh, I was just saying thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any further questions for Josh or Emily, we'll have time for more Q&A in a little while. If you Are you guys going to stick around till the end? I'll be here, Josh. I got to go back to work. Okay, Josh. I, um, yeah. Come okay. check out the gym. It's amazing. It's, thank um, you. It's Thank you both. I, I have to say, Josh, yeah. I really, I really miss the installation from the gallery. Yeah. I know that it was, it was one of everybody's oh, you, favorites. So it's good to come, see your face again. It. Yeah, good to see you, and come see it out here in Marshall because it's going to live here forever. So thank you, Josh. All right, All right Emily, if any, fun. if any questions come in for you or Josh, then you're the designated person to okay, answer. I'll be <laughs> All righty. Okay, everybody, let me put up uh, their website. See my screen again. Okay. Um, great. Uh, so again, Emily Copas, Carolina Flowers, carolinaflowers.com, and Josh Copas, joshcopas.com, and you can get to those other websites that they mentioned uh, from there. All right, let's review answers from round two before we start round three. Round two, question one. 
While all of these historic clubs are located in New York City, Andy Warhol's stomping grounds, the answer is Studio 54. I don't think that I stumped very many of you on that one. Number two, Jeff Koons created Puppy for Erlson Castle in Germany in 1992, but it now lives permanently at the Guggenheim in B Bilbao, Spain. Can you imagine having to water all those plants? 60,000 flowering plants. Question three. I did manage to stump one of my colleagues with this one. The answer is triangle. Question four. Rockwell's Four Freedoms series is an iconic part of his body of work and has even inspired lots of fun parodies. The family in Freedom from Want is seated around a table about to eat their Thanksgiving turkey. Question five. While all of the potteries mentioned are great English potteries, the one that most of us probably recognize for their famous blue and white jasperware is Wedgwood. And finally, the bonus question. Which of these beers is a lager? Did Chris stump anybody? It's the Baltic Porter. How did you do? Are you ready for round three? Okay, let's get started. Here at the museum, we love to eat. We're very serious about our food here in Asheville in general. So for this round, play with your food. We're looking at artists who use food as a medium. Okay, ready? Let me get my screen set up. All right, here's question one. Maurizio Catalan's Comedian, which debuted at Art Basel Miami Beach last year, caused fierce debate in art circles worldwide. What were its two primary materials? A, apple and wood, B, banana and tape, C, pear and glass, or D, pineapple and ceramic. Maurizio Catalan's Comedian, which debuted at Art Basel Miami Beach last year, caused fierce debate in art circles worldwide. What were its two primary materials? Was it A, apple and wood, B, banana and tape, C, pear and glass, or D, pineapple and ceramic. Question two. Felix Gonzalez Torres's installations made from individually wrapped pieces of hard candy are an example of which art movement? Is it A, abstract expressionism, B, conceptual art, C, earth art, or D, photorealism. Felix Gonzalez Torres's installations made from individually wrapped pieces of hard candy are an example of which art movement? Is it A, abstract expressionism, B, conceptual art, C, earth art, or D, photorealism? Number three, made from sugar and molasses, Carol Walker's monumental 2014 sculpture, A Subtlety or The Marvelous Sugar Baby, took which ancient Egyptian form? Was it A, Pharaoh, B, Pyramid, C, Scarab, or D, Sphinx? Made from sugar and molasses, Kara Walker's monumental 2014 sculpture, A Subtlety or The Marvelous Sugar Baby, took which ancient Egyptian form? Was it A, Pharaoh, B, Pyramid, C, Scarab, or D, Sphinx? Number four. Vic Muniz is known for creating artworks out of yummy ingredients. Which one of these foodstuffs is not associated with his culinary creations? Is it A, chocolate, B, 
cookie dough, C, sugar, or D, tomato sauce. Vic Muniz is known for creating artworks out of yummy ingredients. Which one of these foodstuffs is not associated with his culinary creations? A, chocolate, B, cookie dough, C, sugar, or D, tomato sauce? Number five, for her 2010 project Icons at the Brooklyn Museum, Jennifer Rubel created a 20-foot pinata of this pop artist's head, which spilled out Twinkies, Ding Dongs, and Ho-Hos when visitors broke it open with baseball bats. Is it A, Andy Warhol, B, Claude Monet, C, Michelangelo, or D, Yoyoi Kusama? For her 2010 project Icons at the Brooklyn Museum, Jennifer Rubel created a 20-foot pinata of this pop artist's head, which spilled out Twinkies, Ding Dongs, and Ho-Hos when visitors broke it open with baseball bats. A. Andy Warhol, B. Claude Monet, C. Michelangelo, or D. Yoyoi Kusama. Okay, now for our round three bonus question inspired by the awesome tablescape created for us by Emily and Josh. Flowers have a long history of symbolism in art. In the so-called language of flowers, what does a pink rose symbolize? A, friendship, B, passionate love, C, purity, or D, unity. Flowers have a long history of symbolism in art. In the so-called language of flowers, what does a pink rose symbolize? A, friendship, B, passionate love, C, purity, or D, unity? All right, everyone, that's the end of round three. Are the questions getting trickier? And now it's my pleasure to welcome Chef Tony Fraco of Food Experience, our wonderful cafe partners. How's it going up in Perspective Cafe tonight, Tony? I need the Oh, you're a little echoey. Can you turn that over? Hey. Hi, Kristen. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Tony? Can you hear me? I can hear you great. Can you hear me okay? No. Hi. Can you hear me, Tony? Yes. No, I can. All Thank right. You. Hey. Hey. It's a little crazy up here. We, just, we had a few customers and I was... I almost used up all the food that I had to do the demonstration, but I luckily I have a little bit left. <laughs> okay. I know I'm about to be hungry, Tony. Well, I don't know. We're everyone here. There's plenty of food, so when you're done, please come up. So, um, do you uh, would you like me to start talking about the brats that we're doing tonight, or talk a little bit about the cafe? What do you want me? What would you like? I would love for you to uh, make us some sweet and savory fall treats. I see everything on the table. You've been setting it up for like 20, 30 minutes, and <laughs> I've been dying Longer. to know what you've got up there. Longer than that. Okay, so obviously, um, I'm going to start with the savory, and the star of the show tonight is a house-made bratwurst. Um, my sous chef, Jason Culbertson, is a sausage maker, and hopes to go into that business the whole time. He has the equipment to do it. And he made us these beautiful brats tonight. Um, these are made of pork shoulder, cream, an egg, a little bit of butter, salt, ginger, and white pepper. And he uh, grinds the raw shoulder, mixes it up, and uh, puts it into a, an extruding machine. 
into these real casings. So I know that doesn't sound really, uh, you know, it's kind of the mechanical side of cooking, but the end result is so delicious. These are wonderful. I've had a few people here eat them tonight. Kelly, who's behind the scenes right next to me, had some. They're delicious. And we're, um, <laughs> thumbs up. And we're just doing it on a simple French roll. And we've got some house-made kimchi here. Um, and we've got some sauerkraut, some wonderful lusty monk uh, mustard. And basically we're waiting for Elena to bring me back a finished press, pressed uh, version of it. And, um, you know, we're offering it, it is, this is an, a variety of acorn squash that I found at the West Asheville Farmer's Market yesterday. See the skin, it's like a lemon acorn. Um, I just cooked it with a little bit of olive oil, salt, and pepper, and I really haven't done anything else to it. Don't need anything else on it. There's Elena, everyone. She works at our cafe, she's the manager up here. Um, uh, you know, we're just going to serve this. I have to sit down, but we're going to serve. I can't cut sitting down. We're going to serve it on the bun with, I think the favorite is the house kimchi. You know, it's mine. A little lusty monk mustard. And we're going to pin it. And who is going to be the lucky one of our, I think, did you guys get some already? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Don't give it all away, Tony. I'm going to have to come <laughs> up here and get some. <laughs> There's five or six more. I have so many. A little bit of acorn squash, and there you go. I mean, obviously, it's a really delicious little tree. And I think we're going to have it up here as a special on the weekend in honor of October, in honor of... Uh, Oktoberfest, um, be great with a beer. We've got some wonderful beers up here. So, and I'm not going to plug those. But anyway, we've got that. Looks wonderful, Tony. You mentioned um, the acorn squash, and I know that you guys are really big on local ingredients. Do you get a lot of your vegetables from local farms? We do. I mean, I think that squash was from Highgate Farms, and you, a lot of people here probably know Highgate, Highgate Farms. But, you know, I tried to go to the West Asheville Market in the River Arts District. And then, of course, there's a lot of farms that um, participate and supply the produce and mountain food products. So we try to use local suppliers as much as possible. It's, it's great and it's more fun, especially for small parties, which is really what I love to do. Thank you. What else you got for us up there? So we have this savory... Um, um, here's kind of the end product. I'm going to start with that. It's a flatbread pizza that, again, we make with just white lily flour, self-rising flour, and uh, yogurt, and a little bit of salt. Another one of Jason's um, concoctions, and I've really grown to love it, and I make it instead of naan. Basically, just mix the dough together and... Um, let it sit for a couple of hours, roll it out, and I grill it on, you know, a hot griddle with some olive oil. And I'm only cooking it halfway through, and then we're gonna put some of this house-made ricotta cheese on it, which is wonderfully fresh. It was made last night. Really, it is milk. Uh, it's a gallon of milk to a pint of cream, a couple of drops of uh, organic, champagne or white wine vinegar, bring it up to 177 degrees and it curdles and you separate out the whey in uh, some cheesecloth and you let it set overnight. It's pretty easy to make uh, and it's delicious and fresh and it has no salt in it. So it's great. So we've got that on there and we are going to put some roasted walnuts. Much easier with the hands. Hey there. I think we have a taker who just arrived for the brats. Tom, Christy, I'm giving that to Tom. Tom's always taking my food. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> and we're going to use a little local honey. And then uh, 
We're going to put this in the oven for about two minutes and garnish it nice and little. These apple matchsticks. There you go. Voila. And it's really um, simple. It's really simple. It's a nice treat. It really satisfies your fall urge for some sweetness. And of course, yeah. folks can go pick apples right now. I think you uh, down in Hendersonville and uh, make both, as you've demonstrated, savory and sweet, um, yummy fall treats with them. So thank you. Please don't let Tom take that flatbread. Because that oh. I'm going to go ahead and call dibs on. It's got a couple of my favorite things, nuts, cheese, and honey. Tom, okay. mine. Thank you. Thank okay, you, Tony. See you soon. Absolutely. See you soon. So um, get this back up on my screen. Um, thanks, Tony. If you have any further uh, questions for Chef Tony Franco or about Perspective Cafe or food experience, we'll have time for more Q&A in a little while. Now let's review answers from round three before we start our final round, round four. Round three, question one. Who can forget that banana duct tape to a wall? Then of course, the guy who ate it the next day. I don't think I fooled anyone with that one. Question two. Felix Gonzalez Torres's untitled installations made from individually wrapped pieces of hard candy are, on, uh, are an example of conceptual art. Question three, Kara Walker's marvelous sugar baby, which took the form of a sphinx, was installed at the Domino Sugar Refinery in Williamsburg, Brooklyn in 2014. Vic Muniz is one of my favorites. I just admit that now. He uses more than just chocolate, sugar, and tomato sauce to create his food-based sculptures, but unfortunately he hasn't tried cookie dough as of yet. Question five. I would have loved to have seen those hostess snack cakes fall out of a huge Andy Warhol head. And finally, the bonus question. In the language of flowers, pink roses signify friendship. How did everybody do? Are you ready for round four, our final round? All right, let's get started. It wouldn't be art trivia if there weren't a visual round. For round four, in addition to asking you a question, we'll show you an artwork related to each question. As before, we'll read the question once, but we'll also show you an image. The poll for responses will appear on the question's second reading. All right, let me get my screen set up here. Okay, are you ready? Here's question one. This object would be perfect for making which drink preferred by Agent 007? A, Gin Fizz, B, Manhattan, C, Martini, or D, Old Fashioned. This object would be perfect for making which drink preferred by Agent 007? A, Gin Fizz, B, Manhattan, C, Martini, or D, Old Fashioned. Question two. Wayne Tebow makes our mouths water with his signature paintings of ice cream cones, cakes, and pies. But his rare paintings of an iconic animal were born from his internship at which animation studio? A, Blue Sky Studios, B, Disney, C, Pixar, or D, Studio Ghibli? Wayne Tebow makes our mouths water with his signature paintings of ice cream cones, cakes, and pies, but his rare paintings of an iconic animal were born from his internship at which animation studio? A, Blue Sky Studios, B, Disney, C, Pixar, or D, Studio Ghibli?
number three. Paintings like this one from the museum's collection are part of a long tradition of luscious still lifes of food first made popular during which time period? A. Antebellum America, B. Dutch Golden Age, C. Industrial Revolution, or D. Italian Renaissance. Paintings like this one from the museum's collection are part of a long tradition of luscious still lives of food first made popular during which time period? A. Antebellum America, B. Dutch Golden Age, C. Industrial Revolution, or D. Italian Renaissance. Number four. This sculptor is best known for public art installations featuring monumental replicas of everyday objects like Spoon Bridge and Cherry, a fountain at the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden. Is it A, Alexander Calder, B, Klaus Oldenburg, C, Louise Nevelson, or D, Isamu Noguchi? This sculptor is best known for public art installations featuring monumental replicas of everyday objects like Spoon Bridge and Cherry, a fountain at the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden. Is it A, Alexander Calder, B, Klaus Oldenburg, C, Louise Nevelson, or D, Isamu Noguchi? Number five, in kitchen painting, this feminist artist used food symbolism to assert that women are able to deftly navigate the domestic and worldly spheres. Was it A, Barbara Kruger, B, Cindy Sherman, C, Elizabeth Murray, or D, Faith Ringgold? In kitchen painting, this feminist artist used food symbolism to assert that women are able to deftly navigate the domestic and worldly spheres. Was it A, Barbara Kruger, B, Cindy Sherman, C, Elizabeth Murray, or D, Faith Ringgold? Okay. Now for our round four bonus question in honor of the yummy fall apple treats shared with us this evening by Chef Tony Franco. How many different types of apples exist worldwide? A, 500, B, 2,500, C, 7,500, or D, 10,000? How many different types of apples exist worldwide? Is it A, 500, B, 2,500, C, 7,500, or D, 10,000? All right, everyone, that's the end of round four. You survived, give yourselves a hand. Before we reveal answers to round four, we have a few minutes for any follow-up questions for our presenters. Chris McLean of Highwire Brewing, Emily Kopis, and Chef Tony Franco of Perspective Cafe by Food Experience. We'll start with questions that have been added to the chat box. Feel free to submit more as we go. I think we actually got them as they were coming in. Devin, were there any last questions? I think I sent them all, but I hope people send some more in. All right, question for Emily. What fall flowers should we look for at the local markets? I think I tried to ask you that question when my microphone went out. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, well, we are very likely to have our first frost Saturday morning here in Western North Carolina. 
and it's going to depend a little bit on where you are and how elevated you are and how wet the air is. Um, so if you love flowers, um, come see us this weekend um, because that will be sort of the end of our major field crops. Um, the dahlias really do not like it. Um, but we'll have chrysanthemums, heirloom chrysanthemums, um, probably close to the end of November this year. Um, we're growing those under cover. So it's, it's the season for chrysanthemums. It's not just the cold, it's the days begin to get shorter and shorter. Only certain plants can handle it and continue to bloom. And that's why we love chrysanthemums. Wonderful, thank you. I think, Chris, there was a question that had come in for, for you much earlier, and I'm sorry I missed it. Um, are there any igloo-themed beers for the coming season? Not that I know of currently. <laughs> that doesn't mean it won't happen. So far, no. What, is there an inside joke that I'm missing? No, so I was talking about um, we are we're going to have uh, igloos for our like beer garden area that uh, that are outside that'll be warmed um, that will you know help with social distancing in the winter times you know even while we're working at half capacity and and doing. Uh, sort of outside seating. Uh, this will be um, an offering we'll have to, to help accommodate. Uh, don't know what it looks like. <laughs> Just know that they are here and in boxes, and I'm excited to see what a, uh, a, a warm igloo looks like. You'll be posting pictures on your website, I'm sure. 100%. It sounds so fun. Uh, another question for you has come in. Uh, for those uh, folks that like lighter beers, what is a lighter high wire beer that you would recommend? Well, our lager is light, crisp, easy to drink. Um, I, I think that's one of the big ones. I also um, would recommend, we, we started a sort of a separate um, brewery that is still brewed by us and still under our umbrella. It's called Old North. Uh, it's sort of uh, like our PBR, if you will, our uh, domestic beer. It uh, sort of harkens to the North Carolina resident. Um, you know, we, uh, as you travel around the United States, you find um, regional breweries that that are sort of like a, a local domestic, if you will, whether it's um, something like Yingling or Lone Star or Rainier. And we've never had something like that here in North Carolina. So we, we started one. So uh, it's out there. It's made by us. And it's only available here in North Carolina. Uh, it's called Old North. Uh, you know, so North Carolina is the Old North State. And if you like something light and easy to drink, it's outstanding. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, a question for Tony. Uh, as a chef, oh, he just left. Never mind. He's not in the cafe anymore. Okay. Well, we'll try and get it back to him. How about Elena? Elena is a chef up there in the cafe. Elena, as a chef, <laughs> and my favorite lunchtime chef, what is your favorite fall dish to eat? Some sort of risotto, like a pumpkin. I am with you. So lots of Parmesan <laughs> cheese and cream. The more cheese, the better, I think, for me. Yes. I got a yes from someone. Seven. Yes. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Anytime you want to make risotto up in the cafe, I'm there. Okay. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. And then oh. another question for you, though. Hold on. Don't go anywhere, Elena. I think this is a question for all three of you, uh, yes. and we, I'll start with you, Elena, because I know you've got to get back up to the counter. Uh, what is your favorite fall cocktail? Ooh, um, so a couple weeks ago, we did a special here with rum, and it was called an apple spritz, and it was rum, apple cider, and like some bubbles, like some um, club soda, and that was garnished with a cardamom pod, and a uh, slice of apple, and it was really yummy. So that apple. sounds so good. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are really loving on the apples right now, rightly so. Yeah. I do love a good apple. 
Thank you, Elena, for stepping Hi. in. <laughs> Chris, same question to you. What's your favorite, I guess, I can't say fall cocktail, although you're welcome to go there, but is there a specific beer uh, that iWire has that's good for fall? fall? cocktail and beer. Okay. Uh, for cocktail, I'm a really simple person. I like uh, the two ingredient sort of cocktails. So uh, uh, ginger beer and bourbon. It's wonderful mm. in the fall, warming, and uh, outstanding. Um, for beer, it, it's hard to go wrong with the great Oktoberfest. Um, you know, and we have, uh, here in Asheville, we have two breweries with gold medal uh, Oktoberfest from the Great American Beer Festival, High Wire Brewing and Wedge Brewing. So Congrats. We're, we're great at Oktoberfest here. <laughs> so can't go wrong there. Well, maybe we could pair that with some of the brats up in the cafe. Absolutely. All right, Emily, that last question goes to you. What is your favorite fall cocktail? Oh my gosh. Um, I'm a terrible person to answer this question. I just, I drink a lot of water and like hibiscus tea. I drink wine socially, but pretty much, I mean, I had the opposite COVID response to everyone else, which was to just like quit drinking on accident. Um, <laughs> so if you were wondering how we get so much done, I don't know. Maybe that's, Maybe that's, that's the secret. Just go yeah. with the tea. The no, tea is your fuel. Hibiscus tea. It's good. Classic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much, Chris, Emily. Uh, of course, uh, tell Josh thank you for us again, Emily, uh, Tony, and Elena. All right. So before we conclude tonight's program, let's go over the answers for round four, the visual round. Let me get my screen set up here. It's a lot of like buttons to push. Okay. Here we go. All right. All right, so the visual round. Uh, question one. This cocktail shaker by Asheville silversmith William Waldo Dodge in the museum's collection would be perfect to make Agent 007 James Bond's favorite martini. Remember, shaken, not stirred. Question two. While all of these are major animation studios, Wayne Tebow apprenticed at Disney as a high school student, where he drew in-betweens of Goofy, Pinocchio, and Jiminy Cricket. As a mature painter, he would sometimes paint Mickey Mouse in his signature style. Question three. Stone Roberts Lemon Lilies and Gourds from the museum's collection is part of a long tradition of luscious still lifes made popular during the Dutch Golden Age. Question four. Klaus Oldenburg is known for his public art installations featuring monumental replicas of everyday objects. This one, Spoonbridge and Cherry, was a collaboration with Kuzia van Bruggen. Question five. The answer is Elizabeth Murray. I think I stumped people on that one. And finally, the bonus question. While about 2,500 types of apples are grown in the U.S., there are about 7,500 total types of apples worldwide. Add it up. How did you do on each round and how did you do overall? Who won at home? For those of you playing competitively, remember that we'll announce the first, second, and third place winners tomorrow on our website and social media. And just in case technology is not our friend, please do hang on to those score sheets. Zoom is wonderful, but as you could tell from my microphone, sometimes technology does not uh, always work the way that we hope that it will. Thank you all for joining us tonight, virtually or in the cafe. Thank you again to our guests, Chris from Highwire, Josh and Emily, and of course, Chef Tony and Elena. We'll be sending out an evaluation to collect your feedback on this evening's program, so please watch your email. The museum is currently open for visitors. We're operating at a reduced capacity and have a number of new safety measures in place. You can learn more about those safety measures at ashevilleart.org slash visit. And if you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider making a donation to our annual fund.
Through the end of the year, all gifts will be matched dollar for dollar up to $75,000, thanks to the generosity of a longtime foundation supporter. Please also mark your calendars for our next third Thursday event on November 19th. We ho hope to see you in the galleries or at another virtual program through our Museum from Home initiative. Thank you for all your support. Stay well and have a great rest of your week.